Let's read the sixth chapter, called The Grace of Ganga. How do you get back to the river? I asked the clerk after we checked in and dropped our backpacks in the sparsely furnished room. The Ganga called me. As we had crossed Ram Jula, the bridge, our luggage strapped to our backs, the river flowed quickly and deeply below. Each year in the monsoon, the water level rises tens of feet, and her springtime gentle flow becomes a rush of summer waves. By mid-September, the rains subside. A brief afternoon storm in Delhi was our only experience of the tail end of the monsoon. However, the Ganga was still brimming from mountain rains and melting glaciers, since they are at the foothills of the Himalayas. The hotel clerk directed me down a narrow alley that ran in front of the hotel between two large ashrams until it dead ended at a small road lined with tea stalls on the banks of the river. I did not want tea, however, or any of the jewelry or religious statues for sale in the marketplace. I wanted to put my feet in the river. After walking upstream along the riverbank a few hundred feet, I found clean marbled steps leading down to the river. Pilgrims gathered on the lowest steps, pouring water over their heads from small brass pots, or grasping tightly onto chains while they dipped themselves once, twice, thrice in the rushing river. Parents held their naked children close to their chests, scooped up water and let it drip through their fingers over their children's bodies, rubbing the holy water onto their own and their children's head. Back, stomach and legs they chanted, Jai Gange, Jai Gange, which means glory to Mother Ganga. And the children squealed. At the far end of the low row of steps sat some meditators with malas, which are strings of beads, prayer beads in their fingers, palms open on their knees. As I walked down the marble steps to the river, I eyed a spot slightly downstream, far enough from the bathers to protect me from their splashing children. I stood staring at the flowing river and at the dark green mountains on the opposite bank. And then it happened. An experience that 25 years later, I still struggled to articulate. From the landscape of river, mountains, steps and bathers came an image of the divine woven into and out of the treads of my visual field, occupying every frame of perception out of the light and colors and shapes and hues and textures of the world I had been watching came a divine form, an image of divinity that blended into and yet stayed distinct from the background. Next thing I knew, I was seated on the steps without remembering how I went from standing to sitting. I was sobbing, breathless, yet with no experience of either the sadness or happiness that typically accompanies tears. The tears were not foreign or external, not due to some effect or impact. Rather, they were myself flowing out of myself as the waters of Ganga flowed by my feet, waves of water outside and waves inside. The image of the goddess Ganga formed out of every color, shape, texture and aspect of my visual spectrum. Here she was, and here I was, yet it wasn't really a her, rather it was an all, an everything, and I, I was part of that everything. There was nowhere I ended and all began, there was nowhere she wasn't. I stared, eyes open into her form over the flowing river. 
I had come home. I sat on the cool marble steps crying into the river. They were tears without thought, not the type I usually cried. These tears were not connected to any idea or memory or anything someone had said or done. They were simply tears of being in the presence of truth. Minutes, hours, days, and lifetimes passed while I sat beside Ganga's flowing waters. My mind had become non-verbal. The only thought that arose periodically was, Oh, my God. It came not as an intellectual thought, but as an outburst. Oh my God, it is amazing. Oh my God, it is so beautiful. As I shifted my eyes from the river to the families on her banks, to the marble steps, the background of my visual field changed. First flowing water, then bouncing children, and pious parents, then the inanimate structure of the steps. My visual field had become split into foreground and background. The background changed based on where I looked and what I was looking at. A person, a pillar, a rock, a statue. But the image of the divine stayed as the foreground of my visual field and did not change. Whatever I saw, a child, a mother, a marble pillar, I cried. Each varying background was the undulating canvas of color and energy on which the divine was painted. At some point, my husband Jim came down. Hey, he said in words I no longer understood. Pretty beautiful, no? My mind was still nonverbal. All senses and awareness and knowledge had dissolved like salt dolls in the watery soup of my consciousness. I was unable to tease apart the various ingredients from the rest of the soup. Words, too, blended into the soup, unable to be extricated. I looked at him and cried as I smiled. Wow, he said, as the tears poured out of my eyes, onto my clothes, and onto the marble steps between us. He sat down quietly next to me. And thus concludes the sixth chapter of Hollywood to Himalayas. I hope you'll join me next time as we read the seventh. Om Aing Saraswatyay Namaha Jaya Gangay Namaha <laughs>